The following is a presentation of the Fairfax Network. When Bruce Catton wrote about the American Civil War in the Army of the Potomac and described innocent youngsters killing one, one moment and trading tobacco and jokes across neutral lines the next, little did he know how he would influence a young reader called Orson Scott Card. From reader to writer, Orson Scott Card would become an award-winning author himself, and Ender's Game would become his most popular book. In Orson Scott Card's world, battlefields become battle rooms and seven-year-olds like Ender Wiggin wear flash suits and learn to save the world from alien forces. My name is Della Kidd, and it is a pleasure to introduce you to this gifted writer. Orson, welcome to the show. Thanks, it's good to be here. Thank you. And joining us are some students today from Thomas Jefferson High School for Science and Technology, as well as Lake, Lake Braddock Secondary School. Hi, Hi everybody. Hi. I'm glad you could come today. Orson, we have lots of questions about Ender's Game as well as many of its sequels. How about if we just go ahead and get started? Let's do it. Allison, would you start us off, please? Mr. Card, I have a question about your main character, Ender. How much of Ender was influenced by Orson Scott Card, and how much of Orson Scott Card is Ender? Well, the, the obvious answer, of course, is that I, I made him up, and so everything in his, his character comes out of my head, but that's also true of the characters you don't like as much. I also made up Bonso Madrid, you know, and so uh, at an unconscious level, they're all me. I mean, I, I have to understand my characters. I have to have uh, some idea of why they do what they do. That's why we read fiction, is, is because it explains human behavior in a way that, that no other uh, form of storytelling can. And so all the characters arise from whatever I understand about why people do the things they do, which really ultimately derives from how I, why I do the things I do, or why I think I do the things I do. But in the strict autobiographical, autobiographical sense, nothing from Ender is me. Uh, I was not that smart. I wasn't good at anything like that. I was not pulled out of a regular school and put into a special place. Uh, I just lived an ordinary sort of Ray Bradbury-ish uh, dandelion wine childhood and uh, had a very happy time. No one was cruel to me. I was not abused as a child. Uh, <laughs> and, you know, I was just your basic average uh, reasonably smart kid in school. I got A's, but, you know, nothing special. Nobody wrote up a paper about me or anything. Courtney, would you like to add to that? Um, yes. Uh, following Ender, when you first came up with uh, Ender's character, how much did the original Ender change as you like continued to write Ender's Game? Like, how much did Ender change in your mind? Well, see, originally it was a short story, and I had no idea who Ender was. I just knew that they were kids, and, and I knew he was going to be named Ender because I wanted the title Ender's Game because it was a stupid joke about chess, and hey, I was 25, what did I know? Um, <laughs> but uh, I discovered his character by seeing what he did, by seeing what felt right and true to me as I was writing it. That was the short story. In, in writing the novel, then I had to give him a background. I had to go back and give him a family, and, and then I f started finding out who he was by seeing how he responded to uh, Peter and Valentine and, and uh, what, it, what it meant to him to... Uh, I, I don't really plan my characters. I plan my stories, and I have a basic idea of, of fundamental motivations, but what's really interesting in fiction is the stuff that comes up along the way. Uh, my books are constantly surprising me, not in the sense that somebody else is writing them, of course. There's no muse whispering in my ear, but in the sense of what's going to come up and feel right as I'm, as I'm doing it. So uh, Ender changed a lot. Uh, and, and in fact, the hardest thing was that in going back to do Ender's Shadow, uh, working with the character of Bean, I had had Bean do what was necessary in Ender's Game. And I thought I, I, thought I understood his character, but by the time I got back to the shared scenes between the two books, I, I would never have had him say things the way that he said them. He had become a different character from what he originally was, so it was really hard to uh, make those scenes still work. Hmm. Will, how about uh, you had a question for him on a little slightly different level. Yes, uh, thank you. Mr. Card, I was actually rather interested in, in how you personally would explain the battle school and the battle room itself to somebody who has absolutely no experience with your books. And as well, I was also interested in 
why you, I, I mean, I've heard that Ender's Game is required reading for some personnel in the military, in the United States military. And I was interested in, as to why you think that's so. Well, uh, that's two really unrelated questions. I'll try to remember <laughs> the second one, but I may have to ask you to remind All me right. because I am getting old, as we already <laughs> mentioned. Um, <laughs> so the memory fades. But uh, the easy answer is the first one, which is to explain the battle room, I would hand them the book uh, because I already uh, wrote it. And I did it better there than I would ever be able to do just talking about it. Uh, the reason why it was re required reading for a couple of courses in, uh, at the Marine University of Quantico, and the reason why it's still on the Marine Commandant's reading list, um, is not for the military strategy in it. Uh, they, you know, not, nobody's doing zero-G warfare right now. And so it's not terribly important, though it is kind of fun to know that, that there have been attempts to see if Ender's battle room moves do work on the shuttle. There have been some shuttle astronauts who, who tried them, and basically they, they pretty much work. There would be refinements that I wasn't able to imagine, but they, they function. But no, what it's used for uh, in the military is command how you develop uh, leadership, how you're able to put together a group of people. Because it has, you know, it's like textbook cases. I didn't plan it this way. I hadn't studied command as a subject. I'd simply read a lot of, of history. But, uh, you know, the Bonsa Madrid method, the, uh, the Rose the Nose method, the, you know, all, all of these different attempts at uh, leadership that fail compared to Ender's uh, method of leadership. And, you know, with Ender's Shadow, I was aware of the fact that that Ender's Game had been used that way, and so I had to come up with something yet different for Bean to do that, that I hadn't done before, and I just made him deliberately incompetent, which, uh, you know, worked pretty well for the purposes there. <laughs> <laughs> Jessica, did you have a question you'd like to ask? Yeah, um, if you could go back and rewrite one of your books, would you change anything, and what would they? I've done it. Uh, not, not Ender's Game, but, uh, well, actually, I did make some tiny changes, but they, they weren't important. Uh, my very first novel was called Hot Sleep. And I didn't understand what novel structure was. Basically, I structured it as five related novellas. Uh, and th the structure didn't really hold together. The story worked, but my writing didn't. So I went back and rewrote it as The Worthing Chronicle. Um, and that is now part of a book called The Worthing Saga. I also wanted to rewrite my second novel, uh, A Planet Called Treason, because it um, was in first person. And I was ignorant enough not to know that first person is way harder to write effectively than third person. And so I wanted to go back and rewrite it, but the publisher wouldn't give me time before they brought it out again. Not a publisher I was happy with, uh, I must say. Um, and so I was able to revise the opening and do some editing throughout, and that's, that's treason, but, uh, the, the novel treason. But um, I found that that's really unproductive. With each book, I did the best I could do with that story at the time I wrote it. And so just because I can write better now doesn't mean I should go back and redo that. I should write new stuff and do a better job of it. As my abilities have, have improved, the level of difficulty of the projects I've taken on has increased. So that uh, a novel like Past Watch, for example, would have been completely beyond me when I was starting out. I wouldn't have had a clue how to begin. Uh, now, obviously, I can do it, because I did. Um, but there are still projects that are very hard. And, and uh, those are what I look for. It's something that will be a challenge. I believe, Chris, you had something you'd like to ask. I was wondering how your personal faith and uh, other religions influenced your writing? Well, the, the main influence is that I try to give my characters some element of a self-consciously religious life. Most people have some relationship to the purposer of their lives, wh what they think of as the meaning of what's going on in their life. And even if people are determinedly atheistic, I find that everybody I know, when you scratch the surface, they have a religion. Uh, they have a system of beliefs that, if it's challenged, it makes them very upset. Uh, sort of this core uh, system of, of thought and uh, the unquestioned uh, answers. And so I try to give my characters a religion instead of going along with the pretense of our contemporary culture that, that religion is of the past, that it's sort of this thing to be overcome. I've actually been to academic conferences where there were sessions on how to help your students overcome their parents' religious upbringing. Believe it or not, but yes. Uh, which I found outrageous, by the way, in state-sponsored schools to uh, have tax money used to support the deliberate sub uh, you know, subversion of, of religious belief. But uh, all religion is fundamentally irrational. And uh, even those people who are most proud of being non-religious what they're really saying is that their religion is so true, it's not a religion, it's just the truth. And that's the language of fanaticism. Uh, so I try to deal with it in my, in my fiction because it's a, an important part of life. And I think that fiction that doesn't deal with it is 
at least in that area, false. Uh, it's not dealing with the truth of what human life really is. Comments on that, Reese? Um, well, you say that a lot of these religions are so controversial. How do you incorporate them into your books without um, upsetting uh, groups of people? It's uh, pretty easy. Uh, I don't make the reader make the decision of whether the religion is true. I merely let them know that the character believes that it's true and acts accordingly. So that it explains what the character is doing. It becomes part of the character's motivation uh, or part of the, the it, it's the universe in which the character lives. I, I had to deal with this head on with a, a novel called Saints, which was about uh, my own religion, Mormonism, uh, people who joined the Mormon church and, uh, in the early days when, when there was a lot of persecution and so forth. And um, I deliberately wrote it so that you never had to make a decision about whether anything that was said in the religion was true or not. But because you understood why the characters believed it, then their, their behavior became very understandable and, and became important. The thing is, if the characters care about something enough that they make great sacrifice on its behalf, the reader will care about it whether he believes it's a good thing or not. Uh, it happens all the time in, in, in fiction and in movies. Uh, characters are doing dumb stuff that you'd never want them to do, but because they care so much, uh, most teen films are like this. I mean, they're behaving idiotically, okay, and we know it, or horror films. They're all morons. They should all band together, walk in a group, get in a van, and go, you know, get out. But uh, they don't do that. They behave stupidly, but you still care because you care about the people, and that's how it, that's how it works. I'm going to switch topics a little bit. Grace, you had a question for him. Yeah, I'm a big fan of your books, and as I'm reading them, You're I notice... You're not that big. I'm sorry. Yeah, <laughs> I'm a young fan oh, young of fan. your okay, books. That, that's good. That's and as I'm reading them, I notice that the female sex tends to be overshadowed by males. Why is that so? You haven't read enough of my books, apparently. Yeah. Uh, because, in fact, it's one of my hallmarks as a writer that mm -hmm. that's simply not true of my fiction as a whole. Uh, in dealing with battle school, I had to deal with human biology. Uh, if you're <laughs> trying to check, you're trying to find children with the native aggressiveness and combativeness that would make you a good leader in war, uh, that's going to be more represented among the testosterone-bearing population than the non-testosterone-bearing population. That's just a fact of life. And, and while uh, you know, there is some dogma among the politically correct that, of course, that's all cultural, of course, it's not all cultural, and we all know that. The science is in on that particular issue. Uh, so I was reflecting the science. But I have many novels with female protagonists, novels where the females are every bit as important as the males, and I do my best job of imagining human beings in every permutation. It's actually much easier to write women for me than it is to write people of either sex of another culture because I know a lot of women. I, I deal with women all the time and in fact I have a much harder time understanding really macho men. I, I was never that kind mm -hmm. of guy. I never understood locker room talk so I guess I was sort of shut out of that. My androgyny factor is rather high. But what I can't fake is that I'm in the cultures that I'm part of. You know, I'm, I'm an American, I'm a Mormon. Those cultures I know really well. As soon as I step outside the culture that I know, I know I'm going to make stupid mistakes. Uh, it's mistakes born of, of complete ignorance. And so um, just even if I were going to write about a high school student in, in uh, Fairfax County, uh, Virginia, I was never a high school student in Fairfax County, Virginia. I was never a high school student since the 60s. So you're going to have experiences that I just don't know. And if I were trying to write without doing serious research, uh, I would get it wrong. There are things I'd, I'd do wrong. In fact, you see it in teen movies. They're all written by people who went to high school uh, in the 70s or the 80s, maybe the early 90s, but it's different. It's not your high school. And so you see these movies set in high school, and they're, they're not doing your high school. It's not like that in your school. Uh, it was like that in theirs, or actually it was how they remember it through the filter. And anyway, uh, you're going to get the culture wrong. And uh, the way you compensate with that, for that is either set it 3,000 years in the future and just say nanner nanner to your critics and go, hey, it would change in 3,000 years, give me a break. Uh, or um, do your research and then take your lumps. When you get it wrong, you just say, sorry, I did my best. Okay, thank you. With me in the studio is Orson Scott Card playwright, essayist, lyricist, and one of the most accomplished writers of science fiction and fantasy since Isaac Asimov. Orson Scott Card has written many books, but today we're focusing on a series of books known as Ender's Quartet. If you would like to join our discussion, give us a call at 1-800-231-6359. The local number is 703-978-1636. Who has the next question or comment? Eric, do you have something to share? Well, I guess getting off the topic of your writing, 
you seem to know a lot of things, so. Well, yeah, <laughs> I guess you do that. What did you want to be besides a writer when you were growing up? Well, I entered college as an archaeology major. And before that, I'd had dreams of being a, uh, a doctor. Uh, and, and before that, of course, I wanted to be a military leader until I found out the Civil War was, in fact, over. And, <laughs> and you had to go through basic training. And I knew that, that uh, the obstacle course I'd seen, there was a rope climb and stuff like that. You know, I'd never been able to do that. I don't care. You know, there was no age at which I was capable of those physical feats. So the military was out. Medicine was out because you had to actually know math. Uh, yeah. and, and it was just boring. You know, I could do it, but it was slow, and there were people for whom it was quick. And so, you know. Uh, but I, I ended up gravitating to theater because it was fun. And uh, I found that archaeology was dull. Uh, the life of an archaeologist consists of either being on a dig, which means lots and lots of work under the hot sun, digging stuff out a tenth of an inch at a time, and, uh, and then putting together pieces of pottery. Uh, you know, just, it sounded really dull. What I wanted was to read books written by archaeologists. I found that that was where my interest was. Uh, so I got into theater, which was something I could actually do and enjoy doing. And uh, so that was, that was what, I was, what I was trained for. But now I can't remember the root of the question. I started getting off in personal memoir here. Uh, that was, that was, was, I answer, was I answering it? Uh, no, when you said, w but, oh, I know what it was. I wanted to follow up on your saying that I seem to know a lot of things. Well, actually, you know, there's the epistemological question, do we really know anything? Uh, and and the, my answer is no, but we always make our best stab and try to live anyway. But uh, I do tell my writing students that a good writer has to know everything about everything, especially a writer of fiction. Even though we're making the stuff up, it has to be plausible. We bear a higher burden of plausibility than, say, news reporters who can always say, hey, I just quote my sources. But with fiction, I can't say, I quote my sources. You know, uh, it, it's the worst defense of fiction to say, but it really happened, you know, so what? Shut up. You know, if, it, if it's not believable within the terms of the fiction itself, it doesn't work. So I tell my students, they have to know everything about everything. But since you can never achieve that, you have to write your novels while you're in the middle of learning it. Uh, but I really do make a serious effort that whenever I find some hole in my education, like a few years ago, I realized that because I'd never been interested in Islam or Arab cultures, I knew nothing about them. And that was stupid. And so specifically because I was not interested in it, I went into the research and, and at least got myself an overview so that I could write competently about the culture uh, at, a, at a remove. I mean, I haven't had an Islamic protagonist yet, which would require a much deeper knowledge than I have. But I have used Islamic characters in, in minor roles and, and have had no complaints. In fact, I've had good comments that, hey, you included Muslims. And I thought, okay, cool. So uh, uh, that's, the, uh, that's the goal that I have, is to always be learning more all the time. Great call. We have a caller. This caller is from Mildy. Question for him? Yes, Hi, I'm Mildy. a teacher, and I'm always interested in uh, what people read. Obviously, as a writer, you read a great deal. But more importantly, as a human, what are some books you think are important for people to be reading? Oh, now, so you, you asked the important question mm. as opposed to entertaining. Um, it's actually important for you to read whatever you love. And if you love it, read it. And don't ever let anybody tell you that it's not worth reading or it's not important. Or it's, you know, I, I, get, I get livid whenever I hear some, some and usually it's teachers, uh, sneer at somebody's taste in reading. Oh, you're reading that? And I just think, you have no idea what that reader is hungry for. And if they're finding satisfaction for that hunger in a written text, that already puts them in like the top 3% of the American population. Anyone who reads a book in a year is part of the literary elite. And so I'm, I'm very impatient with people who, who want to say, well, you shouldn't read that. That's not important, or that's not good, or that's not worthy. Having said that, um, then there are books that are important to me that I do strongly recommend as being important for people's understanding of, uh, of life. Uh, for example, Guns, Germs, and Steel is a pivotal book for the understanding it gives of how history works. It's the first book I've ever read that, that really does a serious, competent job of finding a scientific basis for history other than, than just cool stories. And, and these things are culturally important, but, but why things really happen. Um, there are other books that have been important to me that, that I, you know, writers, I always urge to read The Lost Country Life. It is a marvelous introduction to an alien culture that really we think we know. It's medieval, English, rural culture. And we think we understand it because, of course, we've all read things with that setting. But when you begin to realize what you had to know to get through a year of life in a medieval village, suddenly you think, good heavens, these people were brilliant. And then you look at what you actually are able to do, and you go, well, I can move a mouse and go click, click, you know, which, which without electricity becomes a completely useless skill. I mean, imagine, you know, 
a survival skill. You're lost in the wilderness, but I have my mouse. <laughs> you know, it's uh, it's not, gonna, not, not worth much to you. Okay. But, oh well, I, I babble. I start going on. Well, we, I know we have a lot of questions yeah. coming. Mariel, did you have something um, you wanted to add? Yes, uh, on a broader topic, I guess. At what point did you decide to turn any of your short stories into novels? Because I know you've done that. Yeah, it's uh, what I what the the point where I decided to do that over and over again was when I realized that for a short story I would get three to five hundred dollars, and then maybe twenty five dollars now and then from uh, uh, republication. But from a novel, the novel can stay in print for a long time, earns me a lot more money. I can make a living writing novels. I can't make a living writing short stories. And that sounds crass, but of course, uh, when you think about it, isn't making a living what responsible adults are supposed to do? And so, uh, you know, when I think of a story, in fact, early on, most of my, my short stories really should have been novels anyway. I just didn't know how to write a novel, and so they came out very compressed. It takes about as much work to write a short story as to write a novel. There's less typing time, but there's more distilling time, and you have to invent the world just as thoroughly. You have to know just as much about the characters. So uh, the real development work is the same. So if I have an idea that I've worked on for a year or two, why not make it into a book? Instead of making it into something 15 pages long, I can make it into something 800 pages long, and, and you get a much more satisfying read, and you don't have to find it in magazines. It stands alone on the shelves, and I get paid a lot more money. So uh, <laughs> it just seems to be a practical art form, art, art decision for me. Allison, you had something to add? Uh, kind of along the same topic, I have always wanted to write, but I've never been able to write anything with huge amounts of pages or detail. What types of processes do you go through? And I mean this on a, like, detail, not necessarily detailed, but are there certain things that work for you, certain areas? Well, the main thing is to, to invent enough. Most, most people who start writing sort of bog down because they get blocked. When you get blocked, it just means that you've stopped believing in or caring about what you just wrote, and you have to go back and revise it and invent more, find out more reasons, more, more explanations. It really comes down to, to asking why, 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 why would this happen, and then why else would it happen? Come up with more than one uh, explanation, more than one result. Uh, no, no event has just one result. It has lots of different results, and the more of those you invent, the more interesting characters you, you come up with by asking, well, why would this character do this? And why else might they do this? The richer your story becomes. The difference between writing something long and something short is basically the difference between crossing a lake in a speedboat and crossing it in a rowboat where you stop and fish. Uh, the goal with a speedboat is to get there, uh, which is d a pretty good description of a short story. The goal with a novel, though, is to fish, just to get there with a boat full of fish. Uh, and so if you just row and row and row and get to the other side and never get any fish, the novel fails and, and you have a 40-page novel. Uh, so you stop and you, you figure out what's going on with this character. You have scenes that really aren't essential to the plot. Uh, you do stuff just because you feel like it. That, it's not padding, it's exploration. Grace, did you have something else you'd like to add? Yeah, um, going back to the part where you talked about um, you are really impatient with people who don't like to uh, read certain things. Why would you censor um, your children's reading choices? I never have. You were uh, It's it's yeah. Wh what I object to is people who dislike what other people read, mm -hmm. who judge other people's uh, reading, with within certain limits. I mean, pornography is is not a literary <laughs> genre. It is a completely different kind of experience and has nothing to do with with art and uh, really shouldn't have any protection. It's it's ludicrous that it does, uh, because it's not part of the business of storytelling. It's not an explanation. It's an event in itself. But uh, when you're talking about the storytelling genres, um, laissez-faire is, is completely what I believe in. If there's something that my children are reading uh, that troubles me, I read it too and we talk about it. It becomes far more effective that way. Plus, I found that my children are extremely sophisticated judges of what they read. In fact, I find that almost everyone is a very sophisticated judge of what they read. I mean, people who are reading, for example, to choose a despised genre, uh, glitzy romances. People who read Judith Krantz select her work, and she's a big hit because her work is somehow better for more people than the work of her competitors. Uh, the, the readers are making very clear, precise distinctions, uh, quality distinctions. And uh, when you talk about it long enough, you begin to discover what those are, what it is that they're valuing in the work that they're reading. And likewise, when I'm dealing with th uh, stories that are, that are troublesome, that are, that are worrisome to a parent, um, then I try to find out why my kid is reading it, what they're getting out of it, how they're interpreting it, 
And I do seed them with, with uh, alternate explanations and, and just flat out say, well, I think that the, the writer is telling a story here that isn't true. And uh, I have far more power in my children's life uh, than, than the books do. At the same time, if I ever show any fear of what they're reading, oh, you shouldn't read that, it just guarantees they're going to read it and take it much more seriously mm -hmm. uh, than they would have otherwise. It's like bad words, you know. When my children came home with bad words, my wife and I made it a practice never, ever to show any shock, dismay, horror. We just say, that will make you sound really kind of uneducated if you use that. It'll make you sound rude to a lot of people. So you probably don't want to use that in most company. But here's what it means, and we give them a literal, fun-removing definition. Uh, and and it, the words just had no power in our family. Uh, and so they knew all the words, and they didn't use them. Reese, do you have a question that Mr. Card could answer briefly? We're starting to run a little low on time. Um, how many projects are you currently working on? Uh, at the moment, I'm working on the project of talking to y'all. But uh, <laughs> in, in, in fact, I always have about a dozen or so in, in the works. I have uh, four movie projects I'm working on. I have uh, two novels that are overdue, uh, and then others that are overdue in the minds of the readers because they're serious, and standalone novels that nobody's expecting, nobody's waiting for, but I'm wanting to write them. So I always have lots of different projects. My biggest project right at the moment is the musical 110 in the Shade. I'm playing file and directing a concert performance of it. And so I flew up here after rehearsal last night. We have another rehearsal tonight, and then we open tomorrow. So anybody who can get down to Greensboro, admission is free. <laughs> Courtney, very quickly, both of you. A question for him, an answer? Um, yeah. Um, how long has it taken you to like write novels? Like, how long did the longest one take? Because you well, always say, like. The typing time is very short yeah. because I have a bad memory and I, I have to do it all while I can still hold it all in memory. So, five, six weeks at the most, sometimes as little as two weeks. The thinking time is very, very rarely less than a year, sometimes five, ten years, depending on how hard the project is and how difficult it is for me to come up with the angle of approach. Well, we're almost out of time. Before we go off the satellite, I'd like to thank Orson Scott Card for making a special trip to our studios to talk about his books and the writing process. If you would like to learn more about Orson Scott Card, visit his website. It's called Hat Rack. That's www.hatrack.com, and it's one of the best sites for readers and writers of science fiction and fantasy. If you would like to learn more about this program, call us at 1-800-233-3277. And with that, let's take another question. What do you have for Mr. Card? Jessica. Are all of your protagonists heroes in your mind? Uh, they wouldn't be worth writing about if they weren't. Uh, you know, I could write about people with dull lives, but then who would read it? And why would I care enough to spend that amount of time writing about somebody to whom nothing important is happening? Uh, having said that, there's heroes and there's heroes, you know. I mean, uh, Ender, Ender saves the world. But I'm perfectly content to write stories also about people who, who just save a child. You know, to me, that's the same level of, of heroism. And saving a child just by teaching them, you know, it, it, it all depends on what the story is. Uh, however, uh, the, the big Save the World stories do have a tendency to find larger audiences. So you're more likely to hear of those than you are to hear about some of the more quiet, uh, domestic uh, stories. Will, did you have something to ask as well? well I, I was actually wondering. In your introduction to Ender's Game, you said that you had to separate the story itself from the writing. And what exactly did you mean by that? Well, it's the same project problem that, that translators face, is that they can't use a word of the original in the translation, and yet somehow it has to become the same story. But when you're translating from one length to another, or from, you know, especially with Ender's Shadow, ch changing the point of view character, it's still a process of translation. It's the same story. The same things happen for the same reasons. But uh, you're expressing it in different language from a different point of view, putting different attitudes in.